The sands of Egypt carry some of the most interesting stories of human history. A civilization that still holds the record of the longest surviving culture of all time is home to many fascinating mysteries that we are yet to uncover and perhaps never will. Whose face is depicted on the head of the mighty Great Sphinx? What did Pharaoh Khufu hide in his Great Pyramid that we may never find? Who were the mysterious ancient pirates of the Mediterranean? Welcome to Nutty History, and today, let's shed some light on some of the most important mysteries of ancient Egypt and find out their untold stories. Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or condone the actions of the subjects featured. The massive pyramids of ancient Egypt are an integral element of their legacy, and another riddle that Egyptologists have not still fully solved. The architecture poses a dire and bewildering question. How did an ancient civilization manage to transport the giant heavy stones needed to build these enormous megastructures without any modern equipment? Certain historians think it was the wet sand that made this extraordinary ambition feasible. According to some Egyptologists, what in the Egyptian desert sand can reduce the friction significantly and cut the requirement of people necessary to pull a sled by half? This is sort of supported by an ancient wall painting that depicts Egyptians wetting the sand as they pull the sled bearing a giant statue. But the questions regarding the pyramids of ancient Egypt go further beyond how they were built. There is also curiosity regarding what they are hiding. The greatest pyramid in Egypt was built nearly four and a half millennia ago for Pharaoh Khufu. Despite its massive size being nearly 500 feet tall and made up of more than 2.3 million stone, there seems to be only three chambers inside it. Now that sounds like an awful lot of wasted space, doesn't it? However, in 2015, a thermal scan was conducted on the Great Pyramid of Giza, and it revealed thermal anomalies in the structure. Another scan in 2017 discovered signs that there might be a large hidden chamber as big as the biggest room in the whole pyramid. Strangely, according to these findings, ancient Egyptians deliberately built these hidden chambers to be entirely inaccessible. These chambers have no pathways or corridors connecting them to the rest of the interior. It is theorized that these chambers were built and valuables were stored in them while the pyramid was still being built and they were sealed afterward. Nobody in the contemporary world has managed to peep inside these chambers of secrets. Definitely, Pharaoh Khufu didn't want anybody to see the contents of these chambers. Maybe it's the records of his browsing history. Who knows? What's browser history? The Great Sphinx of Giza is perhaps the most mysterious sculpture that has survived from ancient times. We are still speculating about its age, purpose, how it was constructed, does it contain any concealed chambers, what was its role in Egyptian religion and society, and why is it next to the pyramids? Located on the Giza Plateau, the sculpture is positioned to face the rising sun for a reason. The name Sphinx was coined by the ancient Greeks who saw it for the first time centuries after it was sculpted. To put their experience into perspective, it is no different than us looking at the statues of Roman emperors today for the first time. The earliest known name of the statue is Horemiket, which means Horus of the Horizon. That makes the statue named after their sky god, Horus. So does that mean the face on the lion-like statue is of god Horus? Unfortunately, not. And that's why this statue is such an enigma to all Egyptologists and archaeologists. Based on available tangible evidence, the consensus among Egyptologists is that the face on the Great Sphinx belongs to Khafre, or Chephren, who was a pharaoh from the 4th dynasty. This would mean that most likely he was the one who commissioned the sculpting of the mythical creature as well. Sadly, there is no evidence confirming it. There are no inscriptions found in Egyptian history that could tie the Great Sphinx to Khafre. But wait, it gets more baffling. As in fact, Sphinx, or Hormakit, has no mention of its construction whatsoever anywhere, as far as we know. Moreover, according to an expert in identification who looked into the Sphinx's imagery in 1996, they concluded that the face of the Great Sphinx doesn't match with Khafre. Interestingly, his analysis suggested that the Great Sphinx has a much better resemblance with Khafre's elder brother, Jedefra. Author Johnny Anthony West was the first to notice something peculiar about the Great Sphinx that doesn't match with other structures on the plateau of Giza. The weathering patterns on the Sphinx were consistent with water erosion and not wind and sand erosion as it should have been. 
This is throwing archaeologists off because although Egypt is an arid land today, nearly 10,000 years ago the land had ample rain and greenery. This means the Great Sphinx would date somewhere between 7 to 10,000, but Egyptologists do not agree. They dismiss West's theory, pointing out that the once prevalent great rainstorms over Egypt had stopped long before the Sphinx was built. Additionally, there were no other signs of water erosion found on the Giza Plateau to validate West's theory. Similar to West, another author, Robert Buwal, tried to date the Great Sphinx based on his theory that the Sphinx, the Three Pyramids of Giza, and the River Nile created some sort of astronomical map connected with the constellation Orion. Now, according to this theory, Sphinx dates from around 10,500 BC, which again is understandably disputed among Egyptologists. The biggest oddity about the sculpture is that its head is disproportionate to its body, and Egyptologists believe that the reason behind that holds the key to the dating of the Great Sphinx. It is theorized that the head of the sculpture may have been carved again and again several times by different pharaohs of the Old Kingdom. It is also possible that the original head could have been non-human and of a ram or a hawk. If somehow we could recreate the original structure, we may be able to date this amazing structure accurately. Ancient Egyptian texts and inscriptions written close to the Bronze Age in the 13th century BC occasionally mention a mysterious naval force that challenged the integrity of ancient Egypt. Between the 13th century BC and 12th century BC, the so-called Sea People were the bane of everybody on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea and intimidated the cities of Hittites, Levant, and ancient Egypt. Some historians also consider these wayward seafarers as the cause of the late Bronze Age collapse. But who exactly were these pirates of the Mediterranean? According to all surviving ancient sources, ancient Egypt was the place where the Sea People participated in their most known battles. Often foes, sometimes allies, and even hired as mercenaries by the Egyptians on a few occasions, the Sea People were primarily documented during the reign of Ramses II, his son Merita, and Ramses III. Oddly, even though Ramses II's inscriptions depict swift and decisive victories against Sea People, they were still a headache for the Egyptian government during the rules of Ramses II's son, Merita. From the documents provided by father and son pharaohs, Historians believe that the Sea People always attacked from the north. They also mention Sea People's city names, Teresh, Equish, Luca, and Sheridan. Ramses III's account holds the Sea Peoples responsible for the fall of Hittites. For a heavy toll on the Egyptian treasury, Ramses III was able to defeat the Sea People once and for all in Zoas in 1178 BC. It has been theorized that the Sea Peoples might have emerged by various means and from a variety of places from the Aegean or Western Asia Minor to the Mediterranean islands. The Philistines, Etruscans, and Minoans have all been suggested as possible contenders for Sea People, but without specific details from primary sources, this is all guesswork. Unfortunately, there are no records of what happened to these formidable foamy foes after their defeat in Zoas and their demise is lost in historical obscurity, just like their origins. Despite the significance of the Holy Land of Punt in Egyptian religion, there is a severe lack of description or directions on where it was located. The only help ancient Egyptian texts have provided us is that Punt was somewhere to the south and east of Egypt, and it was accessible by sea and land. The problem is this is quite a vague description and doesn't narrow the possible location from anywhere in the Arabian Peninsula to northeast Somalia, southern Sudan, and northern Ethiopia or Eritrea. Land of Punt holds an important place in ancient Egyptian history, religion, mythology, and culture. Egyptian writings suggest Punt was a rich location that prospered between 2450 BC and 1155 BC. People from the famous civilization apparently went to Punt when they sought gold, aromatic resins, African blackwood, ebony trees, ivory, wild animals, and slaves. One of the most prominent references to the elusive Holy Land is a relief in the Temple of Athribus that depicts Punt as a lush, tropical land. Another important depiction is at Deir el-Bari, where the relief depicts the outcomes of a mysterious overseas expedition that was led by Queen Hatshepsut. This image, known as the Portico of Punt, presents five ships carrying 210 men while loaded with gold, trees, and exotic animals like leopards, apes, and giraffes. Interestingly, all animals that are found across Africa. 
In 2020, Nathaniel Dominey, a primatologist and professor of anthropology at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, realized an oddity about ancient Egypt that could be the answer to the location of Punt. According to him, baboons, the animals that were often used by ancient Egyptian guards for policing work, are not native to Egypt. The researchers found that the New Kingdom baboons were likely born outside of Egypt. Their origin could have been in the region that constitutes modern-day Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia, none of which share a border with Egypt. This study used mummified baboons, found in ancient Egyptian temples and necropolises to find their real home. Based on Domini's research, Punt must have existed in the southern Red Sea region, very likely on the coast of Eritrea and Somaliland. But he also thinks that this finding is provisional and needs more research. Tell us in the comments who you think the sea people were, or what is hidden in Khufu's Great Pyramid. And as always, thanks for watching Nutty History. If you enjoyed the video, please like and share.